Dr. Karan Singh Ji, Shri M, the awardee this evening, Dr. Merchant, General Secretary of the Temple of Understanding India, Dr. B.P. Singh, Vice President, Temple of Understanding India, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. This is a joyous happening. We have gathered here to celebrate the conferring of an important award on a distinguished person who has contributed his bit so meaningfully to making our world a better place. I felicitate Shri M and commend the jury for making this choice. A celebration is a multi-dimensional occurrence. It is a happy occasion. It is also an occasion for introspection. Some questions do come to mind. Why this honor? What is the relevance in individual and societal terms? Here, as on many other occasions, semantics could be the starting point. The dictionary defines faith as complete trust or confidence in someone or something. A second meaning is a strong belief in the doctrines of a religion based on spiritual conviction rather than proof. Interfaith is thus understood as interaction between faiths or belief systems professed by individuals or groups. Our, de our definition would need to include agnostics and atheists, since they too have a role in society. Exceptions apart, the human being is a social creature and throughout known history has lived in groups or societies that had their own unique experiences and, in the process, developed ideas and beliefs as well as a set of desirable, less desirable, and undesirable norms of behavior. Some of these related to belief systems or perceptions on matters beyond the physical world. Interaction between these social groups, therefore, necessitated interaction between these belief systems. Over time, and driven by the realization that concord is preferable to discord and harmony to disharmony, humankind in different societies sought an understanding of other thought patterns and faiths. This was and remains the impulse for interfaith dialogue. From time to time and in varying measures, it is also reflected in the approach of governments or rulers in individual societies. Record shows that it could be accommodative or exclusionary. An excellent example of high-minded approach to the question is to be found in Emperor Ashoka's Girnar Rock Edict near Junagar in Gujarat around the year 260 BC. And I quote, the king honors all religions and sects. His sacred majesty does not value gifts and honors as he values the growth of the essential elements of all religious sects. But the root of it is restraint of speech. That is, it should not be honor only of one's own religion and condemnation of other religions. On the other hand, other religions should be honored too. By doing this, one helps his own religion to grow and benefit the religions of others also. By doing otherwise, one harms his own religion and injures the other religions too. For whosoever honors only his own religion 
and condemns other religions injures more gravely his own religion. Hence, concord alone is commendable and all should listen and be willing to listen to the beliefs professed by others. End of the quote. The historian Edward Gibbon made a succinct comment on the pragmatic approach to religious diversity in the Roman Empire. And I quote again, the various modes of worship which prevailed in the Roman world were all considered by the people as equally true, by the philosopher as equally false, and by the magistrate as equally useful. And thus, tolerance produced not only mutual indulgence, but even religious concord, end of quote. Either way, principled or pragmatic, societies have developed responses to respond to diversity of faiths within them. This has been particularly marked in the case of India, where a plural society reflective of a multiplicity of faiths reinforced by teachings of bhakti and Sufi saints has been a ground reality for centuries. It was this historical backdrop that propelled the makers of the Constitution of India to put in place a secular state structure premised on equality and fraternity. It also brought us face to face with Dr. Ambedkar called the life of contradictions and tardiness in the recognition of evils that lie across our path. Friends, societies are living entities that respond to challenges of changing times. India is no exception to it. In the globalizing world of the 21st century, spaces have shrunk, traditional practices are being eschewed, and new means of communication, apart from the good they bring, also are also fac facilitating the communication of prejudices and mischief. Each of these impedes the effort to understand the other who may be a neighbor, a fellow citizen, a fellow human being. What then is the choice before us? One option is to remain embedded in our prejudices and take them to their logical conclusion through the promotion of strife to overcome the other. The other is to seek understanding in the expectation that disagreements would be narrowed, perhaps even eliminated. The first option is becoming increasingly impractical since strife would disrupt social peace, impede development, and thus obstruct the achievement of national objectives in any modern society. The quest for understanding is a complex process. It proceeds from impressions and vivid mental phenomena to reasoned ideas based on factual information or conclusions derived from them. The first step in this process is tolerance, an acceptance that the other, though different, may not be harmful or undesirable. Its apogee would be acceptance that the other, though different, is not harmful or undesirable. Given the cultural and spiritual legacy, we in India can assert that such an ideal is achievable and has, in fact, been advocated by rulers from time to time. One instance of it is Emperor Ashok's edict cited earlier. Another is 
Emperor Akbar's institution of Ibadat Khana at Fatehpur Sikri, as also his assertion in a letter to Shah Abbas of Persia that we must be kind to all people who are the treasures of God and have mercy for everyone, no matter what their religion or ideas are. Much more has been said by mystics and saints. Well known is Khwaja Nizamuddin Aulia's remark, Har qawm rast rahe, dine wa qibla gahe. Every people have a right path, have a faith and a point of worship. Equally meaningful are the teachings of Sant Kabir and Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti. So is Swami Vivekananda's observation that we must not only tolerate other religions, but positively embrace them as the truth is the basis of all religions. In November 1995, and pursuant to earlier UN General Assembly resolutions, the General Conference of UNESCO adopted a declaration of principles on tolerance that defined as respect, acceptance, and appreciation of the rich diversity of the world's cultures, our forms of expression, and ways of being human, adding that tolerance is harmony in difference, harmony in difference, and is not concession, condense, or indulgence, and that it is not only a moral duty, but a political and legal requirement for the replacement of the culture of war by a culture of peace. It emphasized that this is to be achieved by action at state, social, and educational levels. I venture to think that uh, Dr. Karan Singh Saab would have been present when this was adopted by UNESCO in Paris. Tolerance is thus a virtue to be cultivated. Acceptance, however, goes a step beyond tolerance. It is a person's assent to the reality of a situation, recognizing a process or condition without attempting to change it, protest or exit. It can tolerate something without accepting. You can tolerate something without accepting it, but you cannot accept something without tolerating it. Moving from tolerance to acceptance is a journey that starts within ourselves, within our own understanding and compassion for people who are different from us. We need to change our we need to challenge ourselves to see beyond the stereotype and preconceptions that prevent us from accepting others. And yet, principles, however lofty and relevant, will remain in the realm of the ideal unless they are accompanied by an implementing methodology. And we have one instance sitting right here. It is here, it is here that dialogue becomes an imperative necessity. It is only through dialogue that misunderstandings are removed and understanding promoted. How then should the dialogue be initiated or conducted? Dialogue partners the world over have developed modalities to facilitate the process. The late Dr. Asghari engineer, perhaps known to some present here, had written an essay some years back suggesting a set of rules for such a dialogue. Allow me to mention them here. One, those who enter into dialogue should be firmly rooted in the tradition of their faith and have inner conviction. Two, there should not be any feeling of superiority in their 
respective traditions. Three, dialogue should not be polemical in style, should not be focused on right or wrong, and should be conducted to understand the other's viewpoint and its integrity and uniqueness. Four, its purpose should be to explain the viewpoint, not to convert the other to it. Five, the dialogue partners should recognize that diversity is the very basis of life. Six, the purpose should be to promote the spirit of accommodation and adjustment to minimize conflict in society. Seven, the difference between dialogue and monologue should at all times be borne in mind. And eight, any effective dialogue is possible when the partner not only listens, but also makes the effort to understand and appreciate it. I, I commend the effort on the part of all individuals and groups who indulge in this noble venture. Jai Hind.